Good afternoon and welcome to Alaska's Political Insider. I'm Mark Colavecchio. And I'm Doreen Lorenz. And this looks like a sunny, beautiful day outside. It's gorgeous out. It's Memorial Day. You know, it's, it's weird. We were talking this morning with the kids. Do you say Happy Memorial Day? That's something that a lot of people think about. I guess it's okay. I don't no? know why it wouldn't be. I think it's very well, respectful. Some, yeah, some people say, oh, you shouldn't say Happy Memorial Day. Why? We should be proud. Being part of being proud is being happy, mm -hmm. right? Right. That's what I told the kids, so they could say happy. <laughs> I know a lot of people. They ask that though. Can you say happy memorial? Yes, you could say happy Memorial Day. This is this is one of those holidays that's not a hallmark thing. It's not trivialized. You know what I mean? It's not one of those made up. Um, you know, contrived. It's not contrived. It really a, commemorates something special. It's a very respectful holiday, and I think it's important that we do give respect on this day to all of those. Yeah, absolutely. All those who serve, all those who are serving now. I mean, we remember our, you know, dead. Without them, we wouldn't be here. Our country wouldn't be what it is today. Um, and yes, I mean, I, I always tell... Uh, when I see veterans, I thank them anyway. Right. You know, it's one of those. I think Alaska gets it more so than a lot of we states. We have a really high high number of veterans in Alaska, so I think that makes a big difference, as well as the fact that we've had to actually wars fought here yeah. recently, and that makes a big difference That's, too. That's that is correct. That makes a big difference, and a lot of people still in the low 48. I mean, Alaska. It's one of those great mysteries. We are we are still a mystery to the rest of the country. A lot of people don't know that. We fought, World War II was fought on our soil right here. Right. Well, we will be back in just a moment with Dave Harbour and Father Norman Elliott, who will be joining us this Veterans Day. Stick with us. Welcome back to Alaska's Political Insider. Today we're going to be visiting with Dave Harbour and Father Norman Elliott. Thanks so much for joining with us, Dave. Dave, what a pleasure, I... especially on this special day. Now, something I just learned about Dave just a little bit ago is that you are the only person I know who is a Pearl Harbor baby. Oh, gosh. Oh, oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah. Why don't you tell us a story, because I, I think it's a wonderful story about your father. Oh, boy. Well, I told it in, in public about a month ago, so I, I guess I, guess it's I can out. repeat it. It's out the bag, sure. yeah. Sure. It, it uh, it's, a, it's a good Veterans Day story, too, mm -hmm. or, and a Memorial Day story as well, and a Pearl Harbor Day story. In uh, December 6th, my dad and mom were both in Hawaii. Dad was in the Air Force. He was a fighter pilot. Mom was a school marm. They were on a date. They were coming back early morning, December 7th, at 4 a.m. So they had this date at 4 in the morning yes. in Hawaii. Hawaii, beautiful, right? Yeah. Dad dropped mom off. I only, she only told me this story a, a, a year before she died. Uh -huh. uh, dropped her off, and then all hell broke loose. Because right. it's Pearl Harbor. Because yeah. it was the that Torah, Torah, Torah. Yeah. So he, uh, he was at the Air Force Base. Pretty soon all, all of the, uh, the uh, Japanese zeros had strafed the aircraft. So he and some of his fellow fighter pilots were hiding uh, on the side of the airstrip, shooting at the zeros with their 45. <laughs> with the handguns. That's with their all hand they had. That's yeah. all they yeah. had. That's right. And uh, they, uh, mom and dad got married uh, a week later, and nine months later I was born. And, uh, that was that story. So, yeah, yeah. That, and they're story. both they're both buried overlooking Honolulu at the uh, uh, the, the uh, cemetery of the Pacific. So, oh, yeah. very good. Thanks for sharing that yeah, with wow. us. Wow. Yeah. Now you amazing. you didn't share that in Alaska for the first time. You shared it in Texas. When you want to tell us what what well, was it in Texas? Oh, yeah, you gave you're that right. speech. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I put that on my web page. I gave a speech to the um, Texas Alliance of Energy Producers about a month ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know it was a kind of a drawn out thing. I was we were relating stories of the Alamo and so forth back mm -hmm. and forth, and uh, and that there, there was a nexus there. But um, the point I was trying to make to this group, it was a huge group. It's kind of like the Alaska Support Industry Alliance. Right. There were hundreds of people there. There mm -hmm. were. It, it was an auditorium like the Sullivan Arena. It was for the breakfast speech. I was the keynote speech speaker. And all the sides weren't filled. There were only about 400 people in the in the bottom part. <clears throat> and at lunch, um, 
John, uh, uh, oh, former chairman of Shell, John, uh, oh, come on, Dave. Anyway, he, he was the keynote speaker for lunch. He filled the whole place. Of course, it was lunch. Uh, but during that uh, presentation, I, I urged him to think about the kids. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and the policies that the federal government is undertaking that are actually requiring that the future generation pay for the stuff we want today. And, and you, the same thing to some degree applies in Alaska, doesn't it? You were talking about, for example, how we're not filling out of our obligation for PERS and TERS. And because of that, even though we have a lot of money in the bank, we don't have enough money in we the bank. We really don't have... You know, politicians will say, oh, well, yeah, we're spending a little more than we're taking in, uh, but we've got money in the bank. Well, we don't have money in the bank other than the permanent fund if you deduct from it the PERS liability, mm -hmm. which is right. what we owe the state employees in their retirement funds. And, and I those don't, are obligations. That's right. And I don't see why they're not jumping through the roof. You know, the former, uh, it's, you know, TERS and PERS school teachers and, and uh, state employees, why aren't they ringing the bells mm -hmm. of from the steeple of every church in town about the fact that they're in the money right. long term to pay the to, to pay what's owed them. And right. if you don't take care of it now, it's just going to be a disaster in the future. That's right. If, if they keep waiting and waiting and waiting. Well, you can cut the benefits of the current people on PERS, TERS, down to the bone. Yeah. That's not going to pay for it the outstanding for obligation. Yeah. Oh. And when time comes to pay the piper, guess who's holding the bag? Our kids, yeah, and uh, all three of us have kids. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and that's something that we don't. But, you know, that's one thing. I, you know, about the Alaska Constitution, uh, Mark and Doreen, is that it, you know we always talk about Section Eight, and usually people who want to raise taxes say, well, let's look at Section Eight. It means with the maximum benefit for Alaska's people. But if you look at, if you define people as being this generation and future generations, then what you want to do is have a sort of a stable, reasonable policy that doesn't squeeze the last drop of blood out of the turnip for this generation, yeah. but that r rather invites investors to stay involved in Alaska for mm -hmm. decades to come. And has there ever been a discussion on what that word benefit actually means in the context of our Constitution. Is it necessarily monetary Bingo. or does it mean more? You got yeah. it. It really, in my estimation, means a lot more than, than just, just money. money. Yeah. And so if we have that short-sighted look, we're not seeing the big picture. Mark, mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. And if we just take it all now, then the kids will be left with the bills. And But, but politicians, Tend to, it's not that they want to do it, but they tend to gravitate toward kicking the can down the road. If they can please their constituents by taxing more and getting more benefits now, you could say, well, 20 years from now, what does that, well, 20 years from now, I'm out of office and on my pension, mm -hmm. so what do I care? You know, and that's why the well, citizens have got to get enraged about some of these things and get involved and tell their politicians what to do. If your pension isn't funded, I think there's a good reason to care, and all those politicians are on PERS as well. Yes, that's right. So there's no money for them, there's not going to be any and, money for yeah, anybody. But, but you know what they're thinking? I mean, I, I just got it, I, I just got to imagine. What they're thinking is, before we lose our pension, they'll go into the permanent fund to make sure we're taken care of. Well, it's true, they didn't intend the permanent fund to last forever, but I don't think that was the initial thoughts no. behind it is, let's fund PERS and TERS. Not when we've got just about, saying. not when we got, 14 or 15 billion dollars in various savings accounts and we got a PERS liability about the same amount we could pay it all off today and be Don't. and have and the kids wouldn't be on the hook for it yeah. well we've got to take a break but we'll be right back in just a few minutes stay with us here on Alaska's Political Insider welcome back we are joined by our special guest Dave Harbour Dave, tell us about that statue. <laughs> our, our viewers are yeah. probably wondering what that statue is, actually. This is really nice. It's, it looks like an yeah. award. I don't know if they can get a close-up of this. Uh, looks like this I, is kind I'm of I'm pretty warrior. sure they could. If we put it, this let's is, try it over here on camera. This is a statue of uh, Ulchi Munduk, General Ulchi Munduk. Okay. He was referred to over the centuries as the Shield of Seoul. Uh-huh. In um, AD 612, he led the forces of 
Korea to defeat a Chinese army of 300,000 trying to invade Holy Korea. Moly. And you'll notice on the shield there's a bullseye. Uh -huh. The bullseye was the, uh, when I was in Korea on the DMZ, I was a staff officer to General Yarborough mm -hmm. who created the Green Berets. Right. right. And our chief of staff, the next in line, was uh, a guy named Arthur D. Simons. Bull Simons, the guy that H. Ross Perot hired when he was retired to go into Iran and 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 sneak out and get out his uh, that's right hostages. His guys, yeah, his guys. So I mean, these guys were great to deal with, and and all of the general staff. Uh, he he gave each one of us one of these statues to remind us that that we, Americans, and all of the United Nations troops were acting as the shield of Seoul, even in the, that modern day. Mm -hmm. That is a wonderful gesture. Yeah. So it was, it's one of my thoughts as a, you know, as a veteran. So. Yeah. No, it's wonderful. Um, what years were you stationed there? 68 and 69. Ah, very good. My, uh, my uncle was actually in the Aleutians during the Korean War, oh, really? 50 to 53. He said he didn't go over, but he stayed, He was in the Aleutians all that time. And, of course, he was one of those guys that swore up and down he would come back, but he never did. Oh. <laughs> well, you did. You kept the promise. I, so. stay, yeah. I came up, and I stayed. You forever. and your dear mom. You're, yeah, you're that's the right. legacy of the family. I'm the legacy, so I remain. Yeah. So there you go. That's our Alaska connection. Well, I don't know about you guys. I tell you, one of the things on Veterans Day that I think about is that, uh, you know, we're always talking about people in harm's way and the troops over there in a foxhole are driving a Humvee or something and they're, you know, looking over their shoulder and being alert and well-trained and all that. And, and then we're thinking, well, we'll be okay because they're over there. But when I was in uniform, it, there was a lot of... Uh, uh, opposition to the Vietnam War. Yeah. Right. And when we came home, we we felt like people didn't like us. I mean, they spit on us uh, some once in a while. I mean, there were a lot of good people that mm -hmm. you know understood, but there were also the other kind that didn't. And w I always wished and hoped that there were a whole lot of people back home standing up for the same principles that we were fighting for. We were prepared to put our lives on the line, but we were hoping that the folks back home were doing as much as they could to support freedom too. Right. So that means being involved in politics. It means running for office when, it, and, and I, you know, and it means when you see something wrong, when you see something that's going against our constitution, our way of life, standing up and saying so, mm -hmm. and not just being silent. That's right, it takes a lot of courage uh, to, to speak up. You, you should speak up. I mean, that's, those are the principles we were founded on. To speak, we can all be yeah. soldiers. We don't need to be wearing a uniform. Well, no. yeah, because definitely, because often when you speak up, that means you've got a big bullseye on your chest and you have to be willing mm -hmm. to stand there and take that's the right. bullets. You've got to take the shots. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting because Vietnam was the first quote-unquote televised war. You know, the first war that came into the living room. And other than the draft asking people to sacrifice their children to go to war, we weren't asked to do what we did in World War II and, and sacrifice a bunch of stuff and, and pay attention to what they were doing over there. It was more, uh, all you got was the negative aspects, you, you know, the war coming home, and it soured a lot of people on it. Well, I think you're right, and there were so many good things that happened. Now, I wasn't in during, I was in the Vietnam period, but my assignment was Korea, Korea. on the DMZ. Right. Right. But uh, you know, I, I would spend weekends working in an orphanage, and I and I know that a lot of my comrade in arms were doing the same thing in Vietnam. They were doing a lot of, of and the, these community are not service community work. service, yeah. not because you're ordered to, but because that's you, just your nature. You want to, yeah, because uh, Americans do that, mm -hmm. and um, but. But if you're, if you're carrying a television camera and you represent a network and you're in a war area, what are you going to be looking for? You're going to be looking for the, the worst. story. You're the, looking for the a story visual, that's going to sell. The visual, exciting story that will, that will yeah. 
yeah. increase ratings. Right. You're not going to see the story where right. a bunch of guys went in and inoculated some kids to keep them from dying from the things that we take for granted. And that happened. It happens yeah, every day. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Giving out vitamins to children. That's right. Vitamin. We don't even think about that. But giving those kids the vitamins kept them from dying from a bunch of diseases. Well, I can assure you that just, uh, Mark and Dory, just talking about this today gives strength and comfort to the people in uniform, just knowing that we're thinking about these kind of things. Sure. Yeah. Well, they do a wonderful job. Absolutely. We've got to take a break, but don't go away. We'll be right back in just a few minutes here on Alaska Political Insider with Dave Harbour. We're back into our conversation with Dave Harbour. Now, Dave, sometimes people have really good efforts and energies, yet other people try to sabotage what's going on. And we see that in Alaska all the time. There's very different, uh, differences of opinion on whether a project should go and not go. Hmm. You have a big bunch of people rushing for it, uh, other people trying to undermine it. You have a personal war story of sabotage with your Uncle Bill and the great extent that that had. Perhaps oh, you can ex express that to us. Boy, you've done your us. research. Wow. <laughs> Doreen looks them all up. Yeah. No, uh, yeah, my uh, Uncle Bill, when I was just a, a little kid, he, uh, he died in World War II. And uh, he was, uh, dad was in the Pacific as a fighter pilot uh, for, for the Army Air Corps. Mm -hmm. And uh, Uncle Bill was in <clears throat> Europe. Uh, flying, he was a pilot flying bombers, uh, you know, in the campaign against uh, the Nazis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they found him on the ground uh, dead, his parachute hadn't opened. And when they investigated, they found that in the factory where the parachutes were packed, uh, there were saboteurs that were intentionally uh, mm -hmm. messing with the parachutes to make sure that uh, guys that jumped out of planes never were able to fly again. Hmm. So that's a pretty too stiff bad. end. Yeah. 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 Well, people, you know, people go to war and die in automobile accidents too. I mean, it's just. Uh, but to 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 die at the hands of a saboteur—that is, someone who is trusted, who's an American citizen, well, presumably working in mm -hmm. our country—that's an especially difficult fate to endure. Do you do you think it's possible that someone who's that misguided? in a time of war. We also have those people in the time of peace that are kind of sabotaging what's going on with our state and oh. the direction of our state. Well, uh, you know, the, uh, Americans have a tradition of fighting for what they think is right. And mm -hmm. our Constitution provides for free speech. So, you know, we need to be careful that, that on the one hand, we don't, uh, we don't criticize uh, the act of engaging in free speech. But on the other hand, you're right. There is very often a con conscious effort on the part of special interests to not create new things or, or support economic development, but to tear it down. Mm -hmm. And we do have a lot of that in Alaska, and it is protected by free speech, and as it should be. But free speech also enables the rest of us who are dedicated to our Constitution our way of life, which depends on fossil fuel and energy mm -hmm. and on economic development. We have to have it. If we don't, if, if we are not strong enough to defend that here at home, then the people defending us overseas and putting their lives in harm's way have got to be wondering, what are we fighting for? Mm -hmm. If the people back home who go home to, uh, to a, a clean sheets and a nice meal at home and and are with their families, if they're not willing to stand up in PTA meetings or uh, assembly meetings or testify before tribunals in, in our own country, if we're not willing to defend freedom right here, mm -hmm. what are they defending? That's right. That's right. If we don't place a, a value on that, then... I'll give you an example. I mean, there uh, we had a hearing last Thursday night. The uh, Bureau of Land Management was having a hearing and, and I'm going to simplify this, but okay. basically to determine whether or not they should shut off development of oil and gas in petroleum reserve in Ala the Ala NPRA. Petroleum, in National Petroleum Reserve Alaska. Right. I mean, how ludicrous is it that 
almost 100 years ago, the, the government under the Harding administration identified uh, the, the Naval Reserve, Petroleum Reserve at that time, as mm -hmm. a place where they ought to protect in the, in, so that we could use the petroleum when we needed it. And then over successive years, the, the federal government and the Congress has determined that, yes, it ought to be, we have reasonable protections, but mm -hmm. it's, it was there for that purpose. And now, under this current national administration at a time when we need the jobs, we need the revenues for federal and state government, uh, we need balance of payments uh, support to diminish the amount we're importing and increase the domestic oil. Uh, when taps is two-thirds empty and we need oil to go down taps, Right. Uh, I mean, how... Crazy I, I hate, that they're having I, this discussion it? at all. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's yeah, really... Exactly. It, it makes no sense. And we it need to be no prepared sense. to stand up and look people in the eye that argue that and say, you are suicidal. You're crazy. Yeah. It's stupid. Well, another good example, you, you And mentioned... well, by the way, we're not being reactionary or extreme to do that. All no. we're doing is trying to support what the country has set up as yeah. a protection for the economy right. over the last century. Right. You we're not at... the ones with the radical ideas. It's no, the ones who are right. trying to change them yeah. that are the radical there ideas. You go. Look at offshore. Look at what Shell has been doing. They've been spending billions of dollars because they know that there's up to 26 billion barrels of oil out there. And, you know, group after group after group, that's a, that's a million barrels a day on its own. Yeah. And, and they keep trying to stop. And, I, you know, I've actually been encouraged by recent rulings by judges to clear the way. For whatever reason, they're finally seeing the frivolity of a lot of these lawsuits that are being put forth. Right. I mean, it's just, like you said, it's insanity. That's a very good observation. But, uh, but see, the, the strategy of these groups, it's very much like we're in a war because they're undertaking strategy too. And if they do, are able to, through the BLM's regulatory apparatus, to, uh, to, to establish uh, wild and scenic river designation for watersheds uh, and, and sensitive areas from an environmental viewpoint, using whatever science or rationale they want to, they can stop a pipeline for right. going through there that would take the oil from the OCS to TAPS, mm -hmm. which could make the project uneconomic even if oil is discovered. That's right. Or it could force them, it could force Shell to say, well, we can't get it to the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. I guess we'll have to move it uh, directly by ship. Through uh, the Arctic Ocean. Through the Arctic, and then yeah. uh, avoid a lot of the benefits that would have come to Alaska. Correct. We have to take a break. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Alaska's Political Insider. We're talking to Dave Harbor. Um, I, you know, we look at Shell and they're offshore, and, and they're moving. They're moving slowly, but they're moving. It's not just the big guys. There's some it's independents who are having too. troubles drilling because lawsuits are filed, not even against them, I think against the state, saying, hey, they shouldn't be drilling here. Oh, look at the work that Great Bear is doing, right? So far, they've been able to kind of keep their project moving. But you know as well as I do that somebody's going to pop up somewhere. I mean, they're, gonna, they're getting ready to drill this summer. Mm -hmm. And I think they're even surprised that nobody has come forth yet yeah, and said, whoa, whoa, word. whoa, 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 stop the fracking. How can we make things so that people can reasonably sue for reasonable reasons, but these frivolous lawsuits, especially against development, are simply abated somehow? Congress needs to act. Uh, some decades ago, the Congress set up a system whereby so-called public interest organizations could sue the federal government and be reimbursed for their uh, for Expenses. their court costs yeah and that's probably the biggest uh, incentive to uh, suing on these development projects because there's no downside for the environmental uh, if you take an environmental extreme position and just say no stop this stop this stop this stop this stop this basically every project there's a roadblock mm -hmm. uh, and you go to court, then the, the judge, based on precedent, uh, is going to uh, make sure that your court costs get 
uh, refunded. So and they really have no skin in the game yeah, at all. They have nothing yeah, to lose. And, and worse than that, if you go to my webpage, northerngaspipelines.com, and look at the cartoon that I put up every day, Chad, it's a beautiful tundra cartoons, mm -hmm. uh, right under it, I, I put a link uh, that talks about this and the fact that uh, the uh, writer interviewed some of the federal agencies and determined that uh, the federal agencies don't even, haven't even kept an accounting of how many millions of dollars they've paid out to these uh, environmental groups for suing them uh, over the years. And they're, they're you know, they're, they should be doing that. As a, that's a racket. You know. that's, oh, yeah. a, that's how the mob works. So they're, they're freedom <laughs> of speech, anybody should be able to yeah. re, uh, seek redress in the courts. but. But if you provide, if government provides an incentive to sue, then obviously some people are going to sue, whether it is on the merits or not. Do they get the money whether they win or they don't? I I believe that that's generally the way it works. That even if they fail in a lawsuit, they get their uh, their court expenses, their lawyers' fees reimbursed. No wonder they're just going. Of course. Every little nook you, and cranny. Yeah. You wonder where they get money from. And if you now, if you look at it again through the eyes of the kids, okay, uh, on a, from a federal viewpoint, we can't afford any waste of dollars because we're right. already overspending. Yeah. So just on the basis of making sure that we pay our own way as we go, we ought to look into things like that. But from an Alaskan viewpoint, with the Trans Alaska Pipeline two thirds empty, it's not only the OCS we've been talking about, and it's not only NPRA. Did you know that NPRA is uh, is bigger than the state of Maine. And the area. The area yeah. is bigger. That, that one area is bigger than the state of Maine, set aside for oil and gas, and there are efforts to stop it. But then right next to it, of course, you know, you've got Anwar over right. there. Right. Yeah. Anwar is as big as the state of North Carolina. And in the uh, Alaska National Interest uh, Lands Conservation Act passed in 1980, uh, there was a specific area in the coastal plain set aside for oil and gas development, yep. but it required congressional approval, and that was done in the early 90s, and President Clinton vetoed it. Right. That's correct. But they're coming back to get it again. But here's the thing. The, because of our advances in technology, uh, only an area of 2,000 acres, the yep. size of Dulles Airport, yep. is needed within an area the size of North Carolina to actually directionally drill out and explore that That's area. Right. And it's crazy that people are fighting against that because we all know in there lies a tremendous amount of oil right. that could not only fuel our state but also fuel our nation. You know what? You're going to hear all kinds of fallacious arguments, too. The other night, Thursday night at the BLM, some of the environmental spokespeople talked about the fact that, oh, you've got baby caribou in the National Petroleum Reserve. They don't talk about the fact that at Pruro Bay, the Central Arctic caribou herd has expanded by about yeah. six times since right. the oil industry came in. Correct. It's partly right. because they're protected from poaching, yep. partly because the gravel pads that are built up don't hurt the caribou. The caribou moms and calves go up on there where there's a little breeze. Do you know that the biggest cause of mortality of caribou calves mosquitoes. is mosquitoes? Yeah. yeah. So when they get up on those pads, they get, they're, they're able to avoid a lot of the mosquito danger. Yep. Well, don't go away. We've got to take a break. We'll hear more from Dave Harbour in just a moment. And we're back with Dave Harbour from northerngaspipelines.com. So the question I have is a lot of people complain that, oh, Alaska really doesn't have that much oil. It'll run maybe six months or so, and then it'll be all gone. Mm. What's your answer to that? Well, probably Mark has a better answer than I do. Well, no, I mean, that's that number we always hear from the environment. Oh, it's only six months worth of oil supply for the nation. That's assuming that every single pipeline, every operation, every drilling project stops right now. Shut it all off, stop it, and Alaska is the only supplier of oil to the lower 48. Yeah. Think about that. Can you fathom the amount of oil now that's up there? I mean, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Well, the other point is that every single oil field in, in history 
that I'm aware of that started started out with a very conservative estimate as to what's there. And they do that on they purpose. Do that. They don't right. want to oversell well, it. Well, and they can't right. because when you're financing a project, pipeline facilities and so forth, you're not going to be able to convince the bankers or the, the market to give you the money if you're using a very liberal interpretation right. of what may be there yeah. if we're lucky. No, it's based on really strong evidence of proven reserves. Now, Prudhoe Bay had proven reserves conservatively mm -hmm. of 9.6 billion barrels when the Trans-Alaska Pipeline was financed and built. And, and talk now, about under-promised and over-delivered, Prudhoe Bay is a gun, gun there. We're about at about over 16 billion barrels. Yeah. Now. Yeah. So, but what? But listen to what happened, though, is from 1980, when Governor Hammond and the legislature agreed on a tax regime for the oil industry, we had 20 years of stability. So the companies knew that a deal was a deal, and what they invested, they would very likely be able to monetize. Mm -hmm. And what happened then in, in the early 2000s with the advent of ACES, all of a sudden, they, they couldn't plan ahead. For one thing, they don't know if the legislature will change the deal again once an investment's made. They're, they, we lost that sense of reliability and stability, and we're going to have to work hard to get it back if we want our kids to have the same kind of a thriving economy that we had. It's, that's one of those uh, really difficult balancing acts because you can't hamstring a future legislature from, you know, quote-unquote, the right of taxation of our resource because we're an owner state on the one hand on the other hand what you can do is set up a good model today that reaps benefits tomorrow that future legislatures can look at and say well we don't need to touch this and I don't think we're gonna, we're gonna have to go too far in the future my bet is that the next legislature is going to be dealing with this issue as well well as a matter of, you're, you know you're right as a matter of fact the, the Constitution requires that the acts of one legislature can't bind the future acts of another. Right. However, in the sense of enlightened self-interest, we all know that when you do a deal, you ought to stick to the deal. And even if you found out that later on you could have done better, if you decide, oh, I'm going to reach back, I'm going to make taxation retroactive, <laughs> once they've made their billions of investment, oh, I'm going to tax some more. What we do is we, you know, they'll sit back and say, okay, if that's the way you want to act, then we have to cal calculate into our future investment the uncertainty that you folks are building into our investment climate. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's very reasonable. You do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Sure. It's almost, it's almost like Atlas Shrugged, where they just throw up their hand and say, you know what? We're on strike. If you make it so bad for me to operate, I, okay, I close the lights right. off, shut it, shut it down. Go ahead, do what you say. And it doesn't mean they're being nasty or no. mean about it. It's they just can't make you a can't, living out of it. You can't, yeah, you can't predict that, you'll, yeah. that you can pay off your loans. Yeah. My recollection is he just set his oil fields on fire and said you want it, it's yours. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Well, that was a dramatization of what Mark said and, and actually you know, in a way, that's exactly what happens, although it's happening here in slow motion. Mm -hmm. What happens, you'll see less and less uh, investment over time. We are already seeing it. We're seeing more and more contractors that we're, they were very busy. Some legislators said, oh, look at all the people employed on the slope. Yeah, they were employed because as these facilities get older and older and older, you need more and more uh, work to keep them operating. Mm -hmm. You've got to put new roofs on the houses. But we're not doing anything in terms of big capital investments that would. And I tell you what, Mark. Next time you you guys start talking to uh, independents, you know mm -hmm. we say all these wonderful things about independents. We all love independents, but what happens is that the legislature is has manipulated language in the tax code that gives a benefit to people to come up and doing some new exploration. Mm -hmm. But if you talk to them privately, they may not say it on the air. Maybe they will. But many of them will privately say to you, well, we came up here and we're being compensated fine to do the exploration, but we're a little nervous about what happens if we find something, then we're going to be in the same tax category as the yep. major producers. Yep. Well, we have to go take a break now, but we'll be right back in just a minute with Dave Harbour. Stick with us.
Welcome back. We're talking to Dave Harbor, oil, gas, Alaska. Um, what do you say to legislators when, when people make this argument and say, look, we got to look forward. We got to look 10, 20, 30 years down the line. And they say, look, it's fine. We're fine. Alaska's fine. Look at all that money we have. You know, you, you know stop being a, a doomsayer and, you know, all that. Well, what do you say to these people? Yeah, that's a good point. I've, I mean, I've had close friends, family members say that to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mark, uh, I'm going to say something now. I don't know if you guys have had a guest talk about recently. Uh, and, and I'm going to talk about God and energy policy. In order to, to have investors think that you have good integrity, that a deal is a deal, they basically have to think you have integrity. Yeah, you have to have that suspension of disbelief that what you say is what you mean and what you do is what you're going to do. And furthermore, that the whole state has it because mm -hmm. you won't elect a majority of legislators that have integrity unless the whole state has integrity. Now, integrity is based on values. Now, you can have values if, you know, uh, in a variety of different ways. But the way this country was founded, if you go back to George Washington's Thanksgiving message and Abraham Lincoln's Thanksgiving message and the Gettysburg Address and on and on and on, time and time again, and, and other of the founders that were with George Washington, mm -hmm. uh, the country was based on a foundation of faith in God and Christianity, frankly. And a belief that without God being with us, we can't do this. It's mm -hmm. too big. It's an enormous, complex problem. I think that's why we have in God we trust on all of our money. Yeah, that's yeah. that's right. And even if it was you, authorized early on, but not yeah. actually put on the coinage until right. the mid nineteenth right. century. And even if but you're your, right. Your belief system is is not a God, but some deity. Um, it's a higher power, and I would hazard a guess anyone who believes in something bigger than us has to understand that we were gifted this place. Yes. That we do have to be good stewards of it. Right. But, but in order to use it effectively so we can perpetuate ourselves. And I, I would beg to offer that even those who believe not in a God that's higher than us, but just in the strength of the individual, are believing in the good strength, solid strength of the individual inside and that integrity that you're referring to. So we all have different names for a similar right. thing, and that is the faith and confidence in the goodwill and good intentions of right. our fellow men. And, I, and I, I respect that that's where you're coming from. I tell you, I put it in a different category. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm very oriented toward specifically faith in God. Right. And the reason is all other forms of of morality are based on um, different and changing circumstance. And so many of them are based on, well, I can't tell you exactly how I react. It'll depend on the circumstances. But anyway, well, let's not get into that. Here's, <laughs> yeah. here's, here's what well, I'm going to simplify it. If we don't have the common ethic that made the country great from its founders. And if we don't have a majority of people nationally and in Alaska who support that integrity of Christianity and, and belief in God, if we don't have that, if we don't have a path, a steady path with guidance from what we call the Holy Spirit, then any path will get us there and we'll find people going along many different paths. So you have some opposed to this, some for this, some for that. And many of those pathways will have to do with, well, we can make something retroactive. Well, we can change the, the deal because we are an owner state. Uh, you know, after all, as one of your guests said a month ago, it's our oil. We can do anything we want. And so our ethic becomes it's our oil, not an ethic that's based on long-standing principles of America. So oh. at any rate, I, I would just say that if we're, you know, if we are not prepared to have a majority of people, if a majority of our people nationally and in Alaska do not go back to their founding faith, then we got trouble overcoming all of these big challenges. Well, we appreciate you being with us today, Dave. 
as always. And now we need to know what you think. You can read your thoughts right here on the air. You can find us at Facebook at Alaska Political Insider. And Twitter, we're at AK Politics. Stay with me. Thank you for watching Alaska Political Insider. What's going to be next on News and Views, Mark? Thanks, Doreen. Well, coming up, we're going to talk about a Coast Guard rescue. We're also going to talk about the Yukon River King Salmon Outlook for this year. And I'll share some Memorial Day stories and your Memorial Day stories all coming up on News and Views. Stay with us. Thanks, and thank you for watching Alaska's Political Insider. Stay tuned. News and Views is coming up next.